So we're in John chapter 19. Amen. So as you get out your love letter from the Lord, your paper Bible, your Android device, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever your love letter is on, I ask that you would get it out and turn to John chapter 19. And as we make our declaration to the Lord that this is my Bible, this is your love letter, this is the word that God has given to you. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert and my heart is receptive. And I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. To, to God be all glory and honor. So as we dive into John chapter 19, I know we missed last week. Amen. But the week before, we talked about Jesus being crucified. We talked about how he was scourged, how he was whipped, how he was how the thorns was placed on his head, how he was humiliated, how he was tried um, in front of the Sanhedrin, in front of the, the chief priests, in front of the Jewish council, and how even Pilate didn't want to even crucify him. He didn't want to keep him on trial. He kept asking him, basically, are you sure that you want this man condemned? I find no fault in him. So as we start off tonight with verse 17 and I'll just read a few verses before we uh, dive into it John chapter 19 New King James Version is the version that I'm reading and it says and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam and woven from top in one place, from the top in one place. They said, Therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go back up to verse 17. And he, talking about Jesus, bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, with the Romans, their form of death or form of execution was by crucifixion. And this was done in order to inflict pain and suffering and humiliation and to create a slow death on the person or the victim that was condemned. Before they got to the place of the skull, which was given the name either because um, that's the place where the people were crucified or because the hill might have been shaped like a skull. So as they walked from their prison cell or the place where they had been pronounced guilty, guilty as they walked through the street to, to Golgotha, to the place of the skull it was approximately one to two miles and as they walked through the street 
they had to carry the beam or the bar on their shoulders, on their back. And this was the part of the cross that would be nailed to the already affixed vertical wood beam that was already at the skull, already at the place of the skull, already at the execution site. So they would carry the beam on their back so that it could be attached to the vertical beam that was already um, at the place of the skull. And as they walked through the streets, many times the people, the victims were naked because the Romans really wanted to humiliate them. They really wanted to make sure that people who saw this, they would be deterred from committing any kind of crime that would cause them to be one of the victims. So as they were, as he was walking through the street with this beam on his back, as he was going to the place of the skull, Golgotha, in Hebrew, it was called Golgotha, in Latin, it was known as Calvary or the skull. As our Lord was walking through the streets, he was partially clothed. He may have had just a linen around his loins. And we already know that he's already been beat. He's already been whooped. He's been beat and whooped. He's been 39 stripes that he, he had received. And with these 39 stripes that he received, he, with the 39 stripes that he received, I'm sorry, this other computer just blanked out on me again. With the 39 stripes that he received, we know that during that time he was also, there was a, uh, a crown that was placed on his head and it had thorns and we realize and we understand that these thorns were these thick type of thorns they were almost like little tree branches that was real thick they're not like the ones that we see out here in our backyard but these were these really thick thorns and they had plaited the crown and they put it on his head as a way of mocking him because he declared to be um, the eternal king he declared to be God he declared that his kingdom was not of this world so this was a way that they were mocking him so we know that his head is bleeding from this trauma that he's already received from the crown we know that his head is bleeding from them snatching his beard out of his face we know that he's walking and, and he's been without food. He's been without water for several hours and, and a day or two. He's been without food and we know that it's hot. And we know that the sand and the ground is all hot. And he's walking and he's trying to maintain, pull up what strength he has to make it to the place that he needs to go in order to be cru crucified. And as they walk down the street, as a criminal, as one that had been condemned, walks down the street, they would have hanging around their neck a plaque like a chain. But on this chain would have the inscription of whatever they were accused of, whatever their sentence was, whatever their crime was, would be on their neck. And the purpose of this was so that once they got to the place of the crucifixion, once they got to this place, that plaque that was hanging around hung around their neck it would be placed on above their head as they hung on the cross so we also discussed last week that the crucifixion was often reserved for the worst criminals it was reserved for the lowest class of people for slaves those who were under Rome's authority or jurisdiction and this was a form of humiliation so that the public could see these victims, so that they could see what they did, and they would be able to read what they did so that they would not cross that same line. Our Lord was weak. He was thirsty. He was in pain. He was in agony. He was grief-stricken, and it had pricked his very soul. He had been spat on. His hair had been pulled out of his face. He had been beaten. He had been scourged. He was unrecognizable because he had been beat and whooped so bad that even his very bones were sticking up out of his very flesh you could see his muscles so just imagine him trying to muster up the strength to take this beam on his back walking one to two miles and this beam would weigh about 70 to 90 pounds um, that he had to take and he was 
doing all he could and while he was walking down the street he's falling three times and the third time he falls a Roman soldier pulls a man out of the crowd and tells him to carry this cross for him because Jesus was too weak in order to continue to carry this cross and muster up the strength to move forward so as I was sitting and I was thinking about the cross and picturing the cross and picturing how they would put a person on the cross and this is so very important because we got to understand all the things that the Lord went through for us. We got to understand what he went through, the agony that he went through just to bring salvation to you and I. That even though he knew that there would be times that we would be, we would turn our backs on him, even though he knew that there were times that our faith would waver, he still went through by the way of the cross to redeem us. So as these men, as Jesus was, once he got to Golgotha, once he got to Calvary, once he got to the place of the skull, they would be laid down on the ground across this beam that they had been already carried through the street. And the nails would be driven through their forearms in order to attach them to this wood beam. So if you could just think about a nail that was maybe about three inches thick, being driven through our Lord's forearms. And he knew he was, that's why when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, if there be any other way, if there be any way that we can do this thing, if we can redeem man any other way, Father, please share that with me. Because see, his flesh knew what was going to happen. His flesh knew what it was going to get ready to go through. I'm sure that during his lifetime he had seen crucifixions on this earth. Not just from his heavenly seat, but he was actually able to see the crucifixion and see what the people had went through. Because see, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's been through so many things that, that we go through. He knows how it feels. So he's seeing all these things and he knows this is what's going to happen to the point that we read that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he started sweating and his blood vessels ruptured and his sweat came out as great drops of blood. Because of the stress that was that he had received. That's why we're told the doctors tell us not to be stressed. That's why the doctors say that whenever you're stressed to do something to relieve that stress. Because it has detrimental effect on your body. It can cause all kinds of ailments. So with the crucifixion it was reserved for the worst types of criminals. And I had to think about well I wonder why. God chose his only begotten son to die in such a manner. And why Jesus would agree to such a thing, such a way of, to die. And then the Lord brought back to my remembrance that the wages of sin is death. And sin brings humiliation. It brings pain. It brings sorrow, suffering, and grief. See, these are the very things that Jesus carried to the cross and he died in our place. So we could be free from condemnation and isolation that was that is brought on by sin. And from the eternal pre presence or, of God, we could be... It was at a point where we didn't even have access to God. But because of him, he said, if I be lifted up... I will draw all men unto me. He said, if I'm lifted up on the cross, I'm going to draw men. I'm going to draw souls to myself. Hallelujah. So even in his weakened state, he still was thinking about you. He was still thinking about us. Even as they nailed him to the cross, he was thinking about us. So verse 19 said, now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So we see that an innocent man, Jesus was innocent. And he was crucified because he spoke the truth. And that same truth was used to condemn him. It was twisted, it was turned around, and the Jewish leaders were saying that he was blaspheming, that he was calling himself God. These are the same ones that are supposed to know what the word of God says. These are the same ones that were teaching the word of God. But yet, they couldn't see. They could not even get out of their own way. They couldn't even remove the beam out of their eye. All they could see was that he was humiliating them because he showed that he knew more of the word than what they did. Because he 
is the incarnated word. He is a word made flesh. So instead of them sitting at his feet, trying to find out more about scripture, trying to find out more about him, they would rather condemn him. They would rather kill him and get him out of their sight. So this inscription that Pilate written, that he had written in place above Jesus, above the criminals, he had this written. Because it was Roman's custom to place the person's crime on a plaque above their head. It was the inscription of their accusation of what they had done. So as Jesus hung on this cross as our sinless Savior, God chose him as the Lamb to take away the sin of the world. And he hung in between two thieves, two convicted thieves, two people that were rightfully there because of what they had done. Jesus took the place of Barabbas, who should have been there, but because of the mindset of the people because they'd rather have evil among them than good. They chose to have Barabbas release and have an innocent man die, but they didn't realize that this was all a strategic plan of our father. This was all God's doing. So as he is on this cross, in the other gospels we see their account how they tell us that the thief on the cross, one of them, tells Jesus said remember me when you go into your kingdom remember me so even though he was condemned by the world yet he was reaching out he knew that salvation was right there he knew that that was a way out for him an eternal way out so he was reaching out to the Savior he was reaching out to the Lamb of God and I can imagine that he must have seen that Jesus was the Lamb that the cross that he was on was the altar that he was being sacrificed for the sins of man. And he asked and he cried out, remember me when you're in paradise. The other thief refused to even acknowledge that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He refused to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, that he was there for his purpose. So he continued to mock Jesus and say all kinds of things about Jesus. He refused to repent. So we need to look at that and we need to examine our own self to see if one of those thieves is us. Are you the one where you ask Jesus to redeem you, to forgive you for your sins? Or are you the one who's pointing the finger at Jesus? Because when you see in his word, when you read the word of God and you see a mirror reflection of yourself, of your sins that you're committing, when you sit in church or you turn the TV on and you hear the word coming and it pricks your very heart to let you know that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved. Do you mock the word of God and say, that's not for me, that's for so-and-so. So which one are you on the cross? Are you the one who asked for forgiveness or are you the one that mocked Jesus and turned your back on him? See, Jesus died on the cross. He died among thieves. He died among the dishonest, the liars, the adulterers, the adulteresses. He died and even fornicators were in the crowd and murderers. He died and with men and women sitting there looking at him. People that were spiritually dead. He died right where people were standing there watching them who were drug and alcohol abusers. He died in the front of Jews and Gentiles. He died in the front of religious and secular people. He died in front of the believers and non-believers. He died in front of the guilty and the innocent. He died in front of the weepers and the mockers. He died in front of those who hated him and those who loved him. But yet he stayed on the cross. He could have came down, but he chose to stay on the cross. Then in verse 20 it says, Then many of the Jews read this title. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So this script inscription that Pilate had written and hung over Jesus was written in three different languages so the readers could read and understand what was being said. The Hebrew or the Aramaic was for the locals, and the Latin was for the it was the official language of the government of that time. And the Greek was a common language that was spoken by many of the people. And he was being crucified right there near the city. So many people saw him. Many that walked by to get to the city was able to read and see what was going on. So 
Jesus, my question is to you, why did his crucifixion take place outside the city? If you think about in Hebrews chapter 13, it says that, verse 12 says, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Hebrews 13, 11 says, the high priest would carry the animal's blood in the most holy place. It would carry it into the holy of holies as a sin offering. And then the animal's body would be burned outside the camp, outside the city. So Jesus, who was a lamb of God, he was sent to take away the sin of the world. He was slain as a lamb for you and I outside the city for the atonement and cleansing of our sin to make us holy through his pure and sinless blood. Then in verse 21, it says, Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Isn't it so funny how people can point things out and they can accuse you of things? But then when it hits the fan, when it comes back around to them, they don't want seem to want any part of it. They don't want to be able to read what they've done. Because see, these same people, these same religious leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the scripture, they didn't want to accept Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't want to accept him as the son of God. They were offended that he spoke the truth and he prophesied. And this prophecy that they were supposed to have known that the Messiah was going to come. And it was being fulfilled in their lifetime, in their very eyes. Yet they didn't believe that he was the king of the Jews. They didn't believe. They didn't want Pilate to put this inscription above him. They declared it to be false, to be a false claim. Which is exactly the exact thing that they had Jesus arrested for. That's what Pilate put on the inscription. But yet they didn't want that there. But yet that is the very thing that they said they wanted Jesus condemned for and tried for. So as they mocked him and refused to believe that he was Christ the Messiah. They played a major role in having him arrested. Falsely accused and condemned. You see, sometimes we ourselves, we look at the bad things, the bad events, but if we take the time to refocus our attention and our thoughts to God and to allow scriptures to teach us, we will be able to see that God is working things out for our good. He's working it out for our good. But we've got to refocus. we got to change our Focus. We got to look at it through the eyes of God, through the lens of God, and allow the scripture to teach us. We will be able to see that God is working it out for our good and the good of others. Just like the thief on the cross, he recognized that he needed salvation. We need to also recognize that we need salvation. We need God's wisdom. We need his strength, his direction, and his help. In verse 22, Pilate answered, he says, what I have written, I have written. So he's answering the chief priest. He's answering these people. He says, what I have written, I have written. Why didn't he stand up when he said before that he didn't want to crucify Jesus? That he wanted them to rethink this thing through. Why did he take a stand then and said, I'm not going to crucify him because I don't find any fault. But now he's going to stand up and he's saying, what I have written, I have written. Because see, it's all the strategic plan of the Lord. So have you ever experienced a time when someone tried to get you to change your mind, to retract your words, but inside you felt that what you said or what you did was the right thing to say or right thing to do? I believe that this is the same thing that happened with Pilate. That the title that he put above Jesus was a proclamation that Jesus is indeed king of the Jews. I believe that he started to believe it himself, but he was afraid to say and he's king of the Jews and we're spiritual Israel. We were adopted into the family of God because the Jews rejected Jesus. We were grafted in. We were given the opportunity to receive salvation. So Paul said, I'm not going to change my mind because I've already heard your argument. I've already heard the reason why you wanted Jesus arrested and tried. And I've already pronounced his sentence and I'm not going to change it. See, 
One thing, Pilate couldn't change it because the Roman law forbade any altering of sentencing. Once the sentence was pronounced on a person, they forbade it to be changed. And also because the inscription that Pilate had placed above Jesus was true. It was the truth. And it fulfilled prophecy. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. They didn't even realize that they were fulfilling scripture. They, they were fulfilling prophecy. See, they were still there. They were still there at the crucifixion because they were supervising the execution. They had to make sure that order was kept. They had to make sure that none of the people's family or friends came and tried to take them down or try to provide any type of aid or medical assistance to them. So they had to actually stay there until each person on the cross that was being crucified died. They had to stay there and witness that. So according to Roman law, when a person was crucified, the executioners had the opportunity to take their clothes. Their, whatever their belongings were belonged to the executioners. So his outer garment that he had, his cloak that he had, that they were dividing up. This cloak was, it was worn over the clothing and it served as an overcoat to protect from rain, wind, and cold. It protect a person from the elements. And it had, it varied in length according to whoever wore the cloak. Some of them came to the hip and some went to the ankle. It all depends on the person. Some had a hood, some didn't. Some fasted down the front. And the ones that fasted down the front would have some type of slit in the sides in order that so that the hands would be able to come out. So the tunic that they're talking about, it was one piece. And it went from the shoulders, it was like a shirt. And it would go down to about the knee length. In Exodus chapter 28, we see that the high priest wore a seamless garment, just like the tunic that Jesus had, just like the one that they're gambling for. And Jesus is our high priest, so everything that we see in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of what would come in the New Testament. It was a foreshadow of Jesus coming. So by them casting lots for the clothing, they were fulfilling Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. Even though they did not even know that they were doing exactly what God would have them to do. For those who just joined, we in John chapter 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that, there, that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So, as I read this, I was wondering, where were all the people that Jesus ministered to? Where were all the ones that he healed? Where was the ones that he healed from leprosy? Where was the ones that he raised from the dead? Where's all the ones that he taught? Where's all the ones that he delivered from demonic possession? Where's all the ones that he fed? Where are all these people? Why did so many forsake him? See, when he needed help, when he needed comfort, when he needed companionship, when he needed their prayer, when he needed their encouragement, none was rendered. It was only a handful that was there to support him that was there to let the, him know that they still loved him. You know, I thought about as I read that, I said, you know what? The man that was whooped and left on the side of the road and the Samaritan came by and rendered help to him. As he lay there, the religious people, they walked by, 
They passed by on the other side of the street. They whispered. They talked about him. They mocked him. They laughed at him. But none of them gave him help. But this one Samaritan. The Samaritans in Jesus' life were the ones that we just read about. The ones that stood at the cross. His mother. His mother's sister. The wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene and the disciple that he loved. These are the ones that are standing there. These are the Samaritans because they're there to render any type of aid that they were, would be allowed to deliver, if at all possible. But even while Jesus was in pain and agony, he continued to show how much he cared. He entrusted the care of his mother in the hands of his beloved disciple. That's John. John the Revelator. John the one who penned this gospel that we've been studying. John had been with him since his the beginning of his earthly ministry, and he remained faithful to the end. Jesus knew that John would remain faithful. Even though Jesus had siblings, he had brothers, he had a sister, he had one or two sisters, he even though he had siblings, he didn't ask them to take care of his mother, take care of their mother. Because, see, we read in the beginning of the book of John, we talked about how his brothers were not believers. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. So he didn't want to entrust her care into an unbeliever, a non-believer's hand. He, didn't, he knew that their house would not be fit for her to be in. She had to be in the house of a believer. He had, she had to be in the house of a disciple, somebody he could trust. That's even on the cross while he was in pain, while he was in agony, he was still looking out for the best interests of his mother, for the interests of those he was so in love with and that he loved. I can only imagine that while his mother Mary sat there and she looked up at her son as he suffered, how he looked helpless and how she thought, my son hanging on this cross, laboring to breathe, laboring to talk, laboring to make sure that I'm taken care of. See, by this time, Joseph must have already been dead because if Joseph was still alive, he would, would have had no reason to ask John, the beloved, to take care of his mother. So Joseph must have already been deceased. He was already gone. He was already out of the picture. So while she's looking up at, at her son, looking at his bones, looking at his muscles, as he, she's seeing all this, it would be like an x-ray vision, how you will see an x-ray and how when you look at the x-ray, if you've ever seen one of your x-rays and how the doctor was able to show you your bones and the muscles and stuff like that, have you ever seen an MRI how, and they were able to show you all these things? These are the things that Mary and those standing there were actually being able to physically see without the use of an x-ray machine. I'm pretty sure that she even felt betrayed. She felt angry and sorrowful because her very own people, even probably some of her relatives, weighed in and, and cried for Jesus to be crucified. They spoke against him. They wanted him dead. I'm pretty sure she got angry during her sorrow. Because, see, she's human as well. This is a mother looking at her son, her firstborn child. And he's being crucified because he spoke the truth. And then I'm sure she reflected on the day when her and Joseph went to the temple with baby Jesus. And when they went to the temple for the dedication, for him to be dedicated. And Simeon held him and he blessed him in the temple. He blessed baby Jesus. And then he looked at Mary in her eyes and he told her that a sword was going to pierce through her very soul. And this is the very moment that this sword is piercing her very soul as she watches her son. And as her sister stand there with her and all these people stand there with her. These same women that stood there giving her honor and support, giving Jesus honor and support. These are going to be some of the same women that's going to witness the empty tomb. He allowed them to see his crucifixion. He allowed them to see his death. But he's also going to allow them to see the empty tomb that he's no longer there as we're going to continue to read later on. Then in verse 28, 
It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. See, he knew that everything was done in a strategic and planned manner. And not until everything that was planned and needed to be accomplished concerning his earthly ministry, his earthly life, did he utter those words, I thirst. He who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sin. He became sin for you. He became sin for me. We got to make this personal. He became sin for me. That I might become the righteousness of Christ in God and in through him. See, when he said that I thirst, I believe he wasn't just saying that he was physically thirsty. But I believe that he was saying, I'm thirsty for the presence of my heavenly father. Because see, God had turned his back on Jesus. Because he couldn't bear to see his son hanging an innocent man that he had to hang on the cross for the redemption of mankind. He had to abandon Jesus for a moment because of the smell of sin, because of the stench of sin. He had to turn his back on him. Because he knew that what had to be done. He knew that Jesus had to do it this way. He had to be crucified to redeem mankind. Now verse 29 says, Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bound his head, he gave up his spirit. Now this wine that they're talking about, it was a cheap drink that the soldiers would bring to the crucifixion for their drinking purposes. Because they were sitting there and they had to wait a long time for these people to die. Sometimes it might be two or three days before they would die. So they would bring things there for their comfort. But this is not the same type of wine that was in Mark chapter 15. Verse 23, that was a different type of wine that they offered Jesus that he refused. The wine that they're talking about in Mark 15 was the wine was to numb the pain and dull the pain that the crucified victim was to go through. That's the one that Jesus refused because he needed to go through the suffering. He needed to experience God's wrath against sin. This hyssop that they placed this wine vinegar on, this hyssop was a plant in the mint family, and it its leaves were bitter, and it was used for cooking and in making herbal medicine. So they placed it on this leaf and they on this spongy substance, and they tried to give it to him. And in Psalm 69, it says that they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink so Jesus was dehydrated I'm pretty sure his tongue was sticking to the roof of his mouth because he had been without water without any substance without anything to drink to provide the nourishment and the hydration that he needed so he's he's here on the cross and he's already been dripping so much blood it started in the garden of Gethsemane when he started dripping blood and then it went through to when he was whipped those 39 times with the whip that was made of metal and bone and and all types of material that was ripping this the flesh off of him so he's been through all this stuff so he has nothing left to give as far as being able to nourish his own body. There was nothing left. He's in the sun. He's in this heat. Temperature was probably in the hundreds as he is in this desert type area. So as they gave him this and he cried, it is finished. He needed that little bit of wetness in order to for his tongue to no longer cleave to the roof of his mouth so that he could utter out those words that he could physically speak with a loud voice that roared like thunder he announced that it is finished signifying to the world both the physical and the spiritual world world that his earthly mission had been accomplished hallelujah 
Those words that he spoke were words of victory. He spoke and he said, when he said it is finished, he was saying that death has no hold on the people that come to me anymore. He said, hell has no hold on him. He said, the enemy has no more hold on anyone that comes to him. He said the religious leaders, when he said it is finished, he was letting the religious leaders know that what they thought they had accomplished, they had not accomplished. He was letting the Jews know that you did not accomplish what you thought you had accomplished. You were merely an actor in the play that my father had orchestrated. He was letting them know that no person could prevent what he had accomplished. He was letting them know when he said it is finished, he was letting them know that the race that he had run, the race that was set before him, that he ran it well, that he had completed the course, that he announced the finishing power of the love of God for mankind. He said, it is finished. So Jesus is the one who laid down his life. He is the one who gave up his spirit. He was willing to release his spirit. He was willing to allow that flesh, that body that housed his spirit man to go limp for the purpose of being able to finish the course in the spiritual realm. He said it is finished. It is paid in full. It is accomplished. He said prophecy is fulfilled. He said sacrifices and ceremonies by earthly priests were no longer needed or accepted. He said death, sin, and Satan's power no longer had power over the person who would believe and accept his finished work on the cross. So with a loud voice when he said it is finished, the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. That was God letting us know that you don't need a priest. You don't need anyone to come before me for you or on your behalf because my son is the mediator. He's the one that is the go between. He is the one that I'm sacrificing for you. So this veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And many of the saints that were in the graves, the graves were opened up and those who were dead came out and they came out as a witness letting people know that Jesus is the Messiah. They came out preaching and praising the Lord. So as this temple, as the veil was ripped, the centurion that stood there that saw this supernatural happening at that very moment that Jesus said it is finished, this centurion said, truly this was the son of God. He was able to recognize that nobody else could have done this but God. It had to be the son of God in order that this happened. So when Jesus bowed his head, when he said it is finished and he bowed his head, it was in a peaceful and su humble surrender to the mission of his father. He laid down his life so that he could pick it up again as a victorious savior, as the chief cornerstone, as the leader of leaders. Verse 31, therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. So the Jews, they, they are something else. They were the reason why these people were there. They were the reason why Jesus was there on the cross. They were more concerned about their day, their holy day, than their own soul. They were so worried about the tradition versus their own soul. So they didn't want these men to remain on the cross because it was a high day. It was a day associated with the Passover. It was the week of celebration. They didn't want their celebration ceremony to be polluted. Remember we talked about how that they wouldn't even go into the Praetorium because they didn't know if if Pilate and, and all of them would have, the Gentiles would have any type of leavened bread in there. And they didn't want... To be contaminated they wanted to be able to participate in the passover they wanted to be able to participate in the celebration so they would not even go into the dwelling place they stayed outside because they wanted to make sure that they were able to participate but yet they didn't want their ceremonial ce celebration polluted with these men hanging dying on the cross as people entered the city they would see and they would be able to 
see what was happening. They would be appalled by what was happening. So the purpose of the breaking of the legs was to speed up the death process. See, as they hung on the cross, they, the beam that they carried through the city was nailed to the vertical beam that was already uh, attached or affixed to the ground. And then on that vertical beam, there would be a little horn or a little stick that would be just big enough for the criminal or the person that was being crucified to sit on. And it was there to prevent their flesh from being ripped. So their feet would also be nailed to the vertical beam. And as they sat on this vertical, on this little piece that was sticking out from the vertical beam, they would be able to kind of raise themselves up to get a breath. But when their legs were broken, they were not able to do that. They weren't able to push themselves up to get that next breath, to get that good oxygen that they needed in order to breathe. They were unable to push themselves up. So since they couldn't push themselves up, that meant that they would suffocate. That meant that they couldn't get the oxygen and that their death would be imminent. Their death would come much quicker. So the one thief that asked Jesus to remember him when he enters into his kingdom and Jesus replied to him, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, if that thief's legs were not broken, he would not have entered into paradise that day. He may have died the next day or the day after or the day after. But because his legs were broken, it fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus had told him that today you will be with me in paradise because the breaking of his legs hastened his death. So that he could enter into paradise that day as Jesus spoke. Verse 33 says, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they should look on him whom they pierce. So the soldiers, these soldiers that were there, they had these executioners. They had witnessed many deaths by the way of the cross before. And they knew and they had observed that Jesus was already dead when they had came to break his legs. But see, they were told that they must go and they must break everybody's leg. But scripture had to be fulfilled so they could not touch Jesus because he, they could not break his legs because he was already dead. He had already gave up the ghost. He had already laid down his life. So none of his bones were broken, but they pierced him with the spear in his side. And I believe it was an upward piercing because they would have been on the ground and he would have been lifted high. So they would have to take this, this, this sword or this arrow and they would have to thrust it up. And when they thrust it up, it would have pierced his heart, releasing the fluid. And see, the blood that came out was the atonement for your sin and for my sin. And the water that came out was the cleansing of our soul, washing by the water of the word. So the blood of the lamb was, we see that it was applied to the doorpost in the Old Testament, signifying to the death angel that a believer lived in the house. Animal's blood was offered as an atonement for the sin of people. But now as Jesus hung on the cross outside the city, on the symbolic altar of the cross as the Lamb of God. His blood was an atonement and an offering for our deliverance from the power of sin. It was for payment for your sin and my sin, which was required. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Which was a required payment for our soul. And it was paid in full by his sinless blood, the sinless blood of the Lamb of God for all those who received him as Lord and Savior. Verse 35, see, John is, is the one that's giving an account of what he saw. And he says, my account is true. He says, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I seen. And I'm writing this for the purpose that as you read this, that you will believe. That as you read this account, that you might believe. Verse 36 says, not one of his bones shall be broken, which was prophetically declared in Psalms 34 verse 20, Exodus 12, verse 46, and Numbers 9, verse 12. 
So we know that his life was prophetically spoken and everything that happened to Jesus was to fulfill prophecy. Verse 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, watch out for those secret disciples, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, another secret disciple, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen, with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb and in which no one had been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews preparation day for the tomb was nearby. See, it was a, it was Romans custom to leave crucified bodies on the cross to rot or to be eaten by wild animals. But at the request of the Jews, because of their Passover, the bodies were allowed to be removed. Now, when you look at Joseph and Nicodemus, these were secret disciples. These were, they came, they had to come out of secrecy in order to be used by God to play their part in the burial of Jesus. They had money, so they could have gotten someone else to do this. They could have, I'm sure it was a messy job because... Jesus was bleeding. He was his blood was steady oozing out of his body. His side was already open with with water and blood flowing out of it. But they took him down. And when a person dies, they also their bowels and all will also be let go because that's their body's way of releasing everything. So it was a messy job that they had to do. So but they wanted to do this. They were being used by God. They were no longer fearful, but had a holy boldness when they went and they asked for the body of Christ. So God used these two men to give the body of Jesus a proper burial and prepare it for its resurrection and witnessing to the people. See, he had to show and prove that he was the crucified and risen Savior. And because of the, the ointments that they were using, it was to fulfill prophecy that his body not decay. The mixture that Nicodemus bought, Psalm 16:10, he was fulfilling that psalm that the body, that Jesus' body would not decay. And I'm sure as they prepared the body, there was a certain way you had to prepare the Jewish body. They had to wash it. They had to clean it. They had to remove any foreign objects. And I'm pretty sure when they were removing the foreign objects, they found pieces of thorn uh, from the crown that was on his head. They found probably glass and metal and bone from the whip. I'm pretty sure that they find material from the clothes that Jesus had on because his wounds were so open. His back was so raw that pieces of the material was probably in these wounds, but they had to wash them. They had to clean them. They had to clean the sweat. They had to prepare him, give him a proper Jewish burial. In first Corinthians chapter 15, it says Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose on the third day. Isaiah 53, nine says they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had not done any violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Matthew 12 says that the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, he was laid in a borrowed tomb. He had no reason to have a permanent tomb because he was only going to be there for a short period of time. So three days and three nights. And he said that he was going to raise himself up on the third day. Then 1 Peter 3.18. And it was good that he was in a borrowed tomb that had never been used because then the Jews couldn't use the, the saying that, oh, he was in the tomb with some other uh, safe person or so uh, some other religious person, and that's how he was resurrected. So they couldn't use that as an excuse because this tomb had never been used, had never been accessed except for to be built. So First Peter 3.18 says he suffered once for sins. Just the un, just for the unjust. He was just, but he died for us as the unjust, for the purpose of bringing us to God, 
to put to death the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. Then he went and preached to the spirits in the prisons who were disobedient. These are the ones that were in there from the, the flood time frame. So he was there preaching and ministering to them. Thank you, God. So because of the preparation day, they didn't want, the Jews didn't want anyone hanging on the cross. They didn't want their celebration to be messed up. They didn't want to be able to see what they had done. They didn't want to be able to see what they had participated in. So with this, where he was, verse 20, 41 says, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And I thought back, I said, you know, the fall of man happened in a garden. Adam messed up, Adam and Eve messed up in the garden. And then we see that in a garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. In this garden, this tomb was new. It had just been carved, maybe carved out of a, out of a rock. It was purified it was clean it was prepared just for it was prepared for one man but yet Jesus would be the first man to be able to use it so as we think about this lesson we need to examine ourselves with the word of God and we need to you need to ask yourself are you a secret disciple because you are afraid of what others may say you need to know and understand that Jesus died and rose to save your soul to save my soul that we need to seek his word to learn the truth and apply that truth to our lives to know that he came to seek and to save the lost he knew that we couldn't come on our own so he came to show us the way so no matter how bad you have sinned he is able and willing to forgive if you will come to him and trust him if you will not allow the negative influence of others to contaminate your soul and cause you to act out of character, cause you to miss the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In order to receive the joy and the peace that he talks about. If you're one of those and you understand that he died for your sin, that he said if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto, unto himself. That once he was lifted up, he's drawing you. You hearing my voice. That means he's drawing you. That even during his persecution, his arrest, and his scourging, and the crucifixion, he was still thinking about you thousands of years later. So if that's you, say this prayer. And meet it from your heart and say it out loud regardless of who's there with you, who's around. And you said, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose on the third day and you ascended back to heaven. I know I am unable to live this life apart from you and I need the indwelling of your Holy Spirit to teach me, to guide me into all truth. Help me to live holy. Help me to live upright and help me to be faithful to you. I invite you to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. If that's you and you've said that prayer, welcome, welcome, welcome to the body of Christ, welcome, welcome, welcome to God's family. Hallelujah. Your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life.